Uh, first, I want to, uh, to apologize for being a little bit late. We got lost, which is very typical situation for the biologists. Uh, you can get. <laughs> You can really get lost in the amounts of biological data. And I will tell you more about it during my talk. And what I will be talking about is integrated bioinformatics systems and tools uh, that we are developing at Bioinformatics Group at Computational Institute of the University of Chicago and um, Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Lab. There is a lot of people working in this group, and they're absolutely wonderful. And along the talk, you will understand what exactly we are doing uh, by doing that. So what are we going to talk about? First, uh, I will talk a little bit uh, about our approach to study evolution of genomes, metabolic networks, protein families, and many more. And this is uh, about bioinformatics, which is absolutely a fascinating subject, uh, which promises a lot, delivers uh, quite a bit, and probably will do, uh, change this civilization in the future. Uh, so then I will talk, tell you a little bit what are we doing. We are building the uh, extra large information systems for high throughput analysis of genomes and metabolic reconstructions for public genomes and user submitted genomes. And if we don't have the tools to analyze this data, we just build them. I will also talk about uh, grid-based integrated computational infrastructure, because the analysis are so high throughput, so complex, so tedious, that it will be just inhuman for people to do it manually. So we are automating uh, most of the processes that we are doing. But the most interesting part uh, to me, because I actually, I, I've heard myself giving this presentation many, many times, so this presentation is not interesting to me. But what the part that is really interesting to me is the problems, and we do have a lot of problems in bioinformatics, and we do need help in solving of these problems. So let's start. Uh, the last several years, uh, not more than a decade, there was a madness in sequencing of the genomes. There are so many. Uh, before I will go any further, uh, do you have any background in biology? Do you know what sequencing of the genomes is? So. Uh, in this case, I will just talk uh, your language. So there was a lot of sequencing of the genomes, and this is, this is sheer madness. What drives this uh, madness is uh, a lot of different groups are interested in sequences and genomes of particular organisms. But what emerges from this variety of the organisms and the individual interests of individual groups is an ability to look at the data and do the comparative analysis across multiple uh, evolutionary domains to, to, to do efficient comparative analysis, because what is interesting is that the major approach that bioinformatics takes is the comparison. It's a comparative uh, analysis. It's a science of big numbers. Uh, it, it thrives on the high throughput comparisons of what is known to what is unknown. So in this case, you can transfer annotations by similarity from what is unknown, from, from what is known to what is unknown. You can compare um, functional and genomic properties of different organisms you know, from different taxonomic groups. Like, for example, what is the difference between the um, uh, sequences and what is the difference between the metabolic pathways for the organisms who live in thermophilic environment versus the organisms who live uh, in Antarctic? There should be the differences, and these differences can be analyzed and formalized on the level of the sequence, gene genomic sequence analysis. Or, for example, what is the difference between the pathogenic organisms and non-pathogenic organisms? Just to give a, you a small example, for example, the BCG um, strain of mycobacteria, which is used for vaccination against tuberculosis, is different from the pathogenic mycoplasma tuberculosis only in 13 genes. And by comparisons, uh, you can probably identify um, um, pathogenic factors that are directly connected to the uh, disease. So uh, in this case, uh, it's obvious that more data you have, more uh, diverse the set of genes that you will be looking at, more interesting patterns you can identify, more interesting comparisons you can do, and more interesting information you can uh, derive for um, bioengineering, genetics, uh, medicine. So um, 
the, the, the goal of this madness is actually to make the efficient information base for deriving the conclusions about the organism's functionality. What is the same and what is different in different biological uh, organisms and how it affects function. But uh, also what I want to know, you to note on this slide is geometrical progression of the data. And I will return back to this geometrical progression of the data later in my talk in the problems uh, side. So we decided that uh, the major thing for us and the, the, the major emphasis is comparative analysis. But in order to support this comparative analysis, what do we need to do? First, uh, biological systems, they are very complex. It's not only the sequences. Sequences have, and like DNA is uh, followed by the gene products. Gene products perform functions. Functions uh, are connected into the complicated networks of interactions. So we need to understand the functionality of biological systems so we can somehow um, control it and modify it. We need to understand functionality of the systems on various levels of organization. And that's why we need to integrate information from sequence databases, uh, features databases, metabolic databases, uh, regulatory databases. More information you have, more different angles you can look at this information. Uh, more comparisons you can do, better you will understand the functionality of the system. So <clears throat> integration of the data is one of the major re requirements for efficient bioinformatics analysis. The second one is we need to have tools and algorithms for pattern rec recognitions and comparisons of biosystems on various levels of organization. It's just the comparisons of the sequences is way not enough uh, for contemporary bioinformatics. We need to push it much further. And this is, I'm, I'm also going to talk about it in the problems uh, um, part of the talk. We also need, but because the amounts of data are so humongous, uh, we need scalable computational resources to do this across the board comparisons. We need to, to, to have on-demand scalable systems. And um, in this case, we, we really need to have a heavy duty computational backend. So the good news is that we can do it now. Sort of sometimes better, sometimes worse, but we can do it now. So, let me tell you a little bit about our approach to uh, understanding of the biological systems. Uh, we firmly believe that uh, to understand biological system is possible if you will understand the way it was evolving. Because what was happening during the evolution, it was almost like um, genetic engineering in action. The systems were, the, the, the nature was tweaking the system to adjust to different um, the environmental conditions. It was modifying it as much as needed uh, for the organism to survive. So in this case, if you will look from the evolutionary perspective, then you can understand the logic of the changes. You can understand why these uh, components were changed and how they were changed. But um, what is happening is that nothing is changing in isolations. Like, for example, everything in the biological system co-evolves. That's why it's a system. It has a system's response. You have a signal, you have the system's response, which means that, metabol like, for example, protein families and the genomes, they are changing because metabolic networks are changing. And metabolic networks are changing because the envir environmental conditions are changing. Like, for example, if you will pour sulfuric acid onto the organism, it, it's better to do something. But exactly what's needed for survival under this uh, harsh conditions. So pretty much um, everything is co-evolving. So if we want to look just at the protein families, we will never ever understand the logic of the changes. So, and what forms these changes is environmental conditions. Something changes in the environment, you better mutate. Um, taxonomy. Taxonomy imposes constraints because you can't evolve without constraints. Like if I am a human, I will be evolving like a human. If I am an elephant, I will be evolving like an elephant. So the, like uh, if you are an archibacteria, you have certain uh, commitments, uh, you, you have certain history and you have the boundaries of changes. So uh, all archibacteria will have share certain properties. So 
uh, also physiological profiles, there are major design commitments that organisms are making. Like, for example, um, uh, to, to, to breathe, to, to use oxygen for respiration or not to use oxygen for respiration. They are major building blocks, major decisions. Like, for example, Thierry de Chardin, which was uh, a wonderful evolutionarist at the beginning of the 20th century, he thought that evolutionary changes is everything that is related to the uh, new access to the new energy sources or access to the new kinds of information. So this is evolutionary changes. Uh, there is a lot of diversity, but really big design commitments, what energy to use or uh, what the sources, mechanisms for acquiring of information to use. Uh, this is evolution. So having all this in mind, we started to build um, the integrated information system. So, and we, my group built uh, the Puma 2 NER system uh, to provide an environment for co-evolutionary, as we decided, um, uh, and comparative analysis of genomes, metabolic networks, and enzymes in the framework of taxonomic, phenotypic, and physiological information. And the reason why we did it, because we really want to understand the logic of the organism. Without understanding of the logic of the organism, it will be very difficult to interpret the events of molecular evolution. So what Puma has now? Uh, Puma is an interactive, integrated environment for high-throughput genetic sequence analysis and metabolic reconstructions uh, with grid-based computational backend. Uh, every single word in this definition means something. So, and uh, I will tell you a little bit more what every single mer uh, word in this means. And these are the screenshots uh, from the Puma system. So. It integrates information from over 25 genomic, metabolic, structural, and taxonomic databases. We are taking all sequence data that is available uh, in the public domain uh, from NCBI, Uniprot, uh, PIR, and we're integrating it in one environment. Then we are also integrating uh, information from the available metabolic databases. And uh, for example, structural databases, PDB, and uh, so, so whatever we can go get hold on the information we're integrating and, and we're warehousing it. Uh, and I'm repeating this, we're, we're warehousing it instead of doing something more reasonable. And I, I will complain in the last part of my talk where we're warehousing it. So, but it's not enough. Uh, this information is not enough for us. So we decide to amplify this information. So uh, we are taking all of the sequence data that is available, and we are actually uh, analyzing it. Um, and the grid technology allows us to analyze it um, using BLAST, uh, blocks, interpro. So we're amplifying the data. We're annotating it with ad additional features. And the reason why we are doing this is because we want to do the comparisons more efficiently. We want to recognize patterns more efficiently. And that's why we are amplifying the data. So we are doing automated metabolic reconstructions. Uh, and uh, I will tell a little bit more uh, about what does it mean to do the metabolic reconstruction. But in, in a nutshell, uh, if you have the functions of the genes predicted in the genome, then you can superimpose it on the functional networks from the uh, databases like Kago, um, we, we have our database e EMP with metabolic pathways. And without knowing anything about the lifestyle of an organisms or their physiology, you can actually uh, reconstruct the physiological profiles. You can reconstruct the features that organisms have and predict certain features um, just from the genomic repertoire. It will be sure enough, it will be not complete. Sure enough, uh, it will have so some of the pathways, some of the genes, they will not be expressed. But at least it's a, a valid model to start from for the experimentalists. So. Um, we have a suite of unique tools for evolutionary analysis of enzymes and metabolic networks. I told you, we don't have tools, we don't wait, we just go ahead and build them. Um, and we have satellite databases. Um, the satellite databases, because we want to look at the certain 
uh, parts of the biological story in more details, like for example, and also because some people are paying us money to do that. We're, we're part of three uh, biodefense um, NIH centers of excellence, and that's why we are creating the PATHOS database. Uh, and we are part of the structural biology, NIH structural biology center, and we are predicting uh, bi 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 biologically interesting targets. So we have uh, several different um, control um, refined data sets. So the, this, the interesting system uh, about which uh, I want to complain in, in the last part of my talk, I am promising so much complaints, but uh, I will really do, that this is NAIR system for high throughput analysis of user submitted genomes. If we have this madness, if the, we have this sequencing madness which it comes as an avalanche of data, you better have automated systems that will allow the user to download your genome and it will be automat automatically annotated and then you, you need to provide the interactive environment for the users to actually refine the uh, analysis manually, but you need to start from valid, good, automated model for genome analysis. And um, so far we have, without any uh, publication yet, we, we didn't even publish the paper, but we already have quite a bit of users, and like we have um, Yersenia pestis and Haemophilus influenza, 30, 30 strains of Haemophilus influenza, and we, we have uh, Shivanello Federation from DOE is using us, so we, we have a lot of different things. Uh, we can process and fully analyze, and I will tell you what does it mean to analyze, <clears throat> the bacterial genome in four hours. And um, it performs uh, the, the analysis and displays the results. So what are the steps of analysis uh, that Puma does and NER does? First, assignment of functions to the genes and characterization of the proteins. So once users uh, have submitted the genome, uh, it is, uh, we are running it uh, on the grid against the array of tools, including BLAST, as I said, BLAST, BLOCKS, TMHMM, uh, PFM, our own tools, CHISEL, and uh, we are collecting all this information to input it into the voting algorithm, which will vote um, to predict the functions of the genes. So it's not enough just to run BLAST uh, on the sequence data to assign functions to the genes because it's too crude. Uh, we are collecting information about domains and active sites and whatever we can get uh, in order to uh, assign functions to the genes reliably. <coughs> so uh, then <coughs> uh, what we are doing, we are superimposing it on the collection of metabolic and functional networks, um, uh, the assigned functions, we are superimposing them uh, onto the known pathways. And this technology was developed by Evgeny Silkov in 1993. And so we're predicting metabolic pathways and providing it an interactive environment for users to refine. <clears throat> and then my favorite part comes, how to predict the phenotypes, how to predict the physiological properties of the organisms, how to identify evolutionary and coevolutionary patterns and signatures. And to do that, uh, we need very efficient ways uh, to do the pattern recognition. And it's better to be multidimensional pattern recognition. We don't have a lot of algorithms that we desperately need. And it should be all in comparative framework. <clears throat> So uh, this is how sequence analysis is done and presented to the user in Puma and NER. So you have information from public databases uh, integrated in the header. You have, uh, you have pre computed data uh, on the right side uh, of the slide. And it shows the similarity searches. This is blocks, this is interpro domain analysis, BLAST. Uh, if you will go down, there will be BLAST against uh, PDB structural databases. Uh, if, user, if this information is not enough for the user, uh, on the left side, you can, uh, he can do interactive analysis. So the, there is a lot of possibilities to refine the analysis. And the user can add comments and annotations. Uh, 
this is how the metabolic reconstructions look like. And what is happening is, uh, this is, for example, the pathway from the MP database. We can also do uh, the reconstruction from the CAG database. And we, are, um, we need to uh, have an engine how to add the user-submitted pathways. And what it gives us, like, for example, this pathway, it represents a glycolysis, which has an alternative behavior. Some of the organisms, they perform ATP-dependent uh, they, they have ATP-dependent phosphofructokinase. The other organisms, they have pyrophosphate-dependent phosphofructokinase. And like, for example, from the genomic data, uh, we understood that uh, Haemophilus influenza was predicted to have ATP-dependent phosphofructokinase. And uh, we compared it, and we have an ability to compare it across the board with all 300 different uh, organisms for which we have metabolic reconstruction. And trypanemic pallidum, which causes syphilis, um, uh, it has pyrophosphate uh, dependent phosphorphyptokinase. So you can start to see the patterns. You can, and if you go systematically through the uh, biological system, you can actually understand quite a bit about its functionality. So uh, we will also sometimes, uh, when you are looking at the pathway, you, you, you see that some enzymes, there are gaps. Like, for example, uh, there is, uh, we, we didn't find phosphofructokinase in so one strain of Haemophilus. So what we are doing is we are uh, offering the user to select the phylogenetically close phosphofructokinase, blast it against genome, and Voila, we found uh, the good candidate for this function. So it, 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 uh, this is a good hypothesis for experimentalists to go ahead and uh, actually uh, verify that this is really it. Um, we can do it from CAG. Um, we can compare different strains, like what is the difference between different strains. Um, and what is important is uh, to have different ways to look at the pathways, to different ways to look at the sequences. Uh, and this is a phenotypic point of view, like uh, show me how it's done by thermophiles, or show me how it's done by pathogens, or show me how it's done uh, by, uh, for example, uh, alpha proteobacteria. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we have created, but what, what we started to think about is, uh, OK, life is a continuum. So that's why everybody is so similar to each other, similar but not identical. So, and like for example, alcohol dehydrogenase, it's implemented differently in different um, organisms and in different domains. In some organisms, it's um, one subunit. In some organisms, it's two subunits. In some organisms, it's ATP dependent. In some organisms, it uses, so, so there could be different variations of the same functions against the genomes. And the amounts of sequence data now allow to look at these variations. And that's why we created the rules-based clustering uh, algorithm which allows to look at these variations. Why is it important to identify this taxonomic and phenotypic variations of functions? First, for identification of the protein and uh, high throughput analysis, but what is interesting is diagnostics. Uh, if you want to, for example, there is a biodefense problem. You want to identify uh, organisms without sequencing really fast. So in this case, uh, if you have an array a library of the taxonomy-specific um, enzymes, oligo oligonucleotides. You, you, you can use it for um, identification of the organisms in vitro. Uh, it will be interesting for biotechnology because uh, if you will look at the thermostable variation of enzyme versus non-thermostable, then it will be also interesting for biotechnology. It's very interesting for interpretation of metagenomes, and Nikos is uh, the, 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 doing the metagenome analysis. So uh, it's useful to do accurate metabolic reconstructions and uh, annotate the organism-specific pathways. So the idea is to identify what is the same and what is different, and how it affects function. We used this for annotation of the metagenome from Humford site. Humford site is the DOE high nuclear waste storage facility. And 
under those extremely high levels of radiation uh, tanks, one of them started to leak. And this metagenome was obtained from this population, which lives under the leaking high radiation nuclear waste in boiling nitric acid with extremely high concentrations of chromium. Every single condition in this pushes the boundaries of life as we know it way beyond our imagination. So uh, we are analyzing these organisms. And uh, actually, it helps uh, to identify the patterns, uh, so the way we are doing it. Um, so uh, how different are these uh, taxonomic variations of enzymes? This is a small example which we'll show you. This is uh, phosphofructokinase. No, this is fructose bisphosphate aldolase, another uh, glycolytic enzymes. Yellow line is the consensus sequence for posterolatia, which is hemophilus. Uh, the blue line is um, the eukaryotes. Uh, the pink line is enterobacteria. And this is the alignment as uh, represented by pulvis. So you see, this part is completely different uh, in eukaryotes. This matisse are completely different in posterolatia. Uh, then enterobacteria has its own unique part. So it can be played with. It can be <coughs> uh, used for different purposes, these differences. So Hanford site metagenome analysis, we talked about this one. We, we have actually identified uh, over 28 species that live in this cozy conditions. So we have pathos database uh, of pathogenic factors. We have brand new central database of signal transduction proteins. And this is how it looks like and it superimposes it on pathways, and you can do comparative analysis. Uh, the signal transduction systems, uh, it's like um, the sensors for bacteria. And if they don't sense the sequence uh, signal, then they can't do anything about it. So if you will identify what they see, uh, you can infer their physiology to some extent. Target database. And this slide uh, is unintelligible. But it's actually, um, I put it here just to show you the complexity of computational backend. And the system con consists, uh, that drives all this analysis, it consists of uh, five, four conceptual parts. So first you need to have portal, so you can support analysis by the groups, and you can uh, have the secure environment. So, uh, and partitioning of the web space. Then you, you definitely cannot do all this analysis um, manually. So we're expressing our workflow pipelines in virtual data language, VDL, and Chimera system. We are interacting closely, working closely with the Globus, world, uh, Globus group, um, Ian, Ian's Foster group. Um, and we're expressing the workflows <coughs> and checkers uh, in math languages, so, and also uh, it's necessary to do that uh, to drive processes to the grid. And um, we are using grid as a computational backend. Both University of Chicago and Darwin, they have very uh, extensive supercomputing capabilities, but uh, it's not enough because you need the reservations, and we are too lazy to wait for the reservations. So if we want to do high throughput genome analysis, we are just grabbing uh, the, the last run that we had, it was 1,700 CPUs. And some of them, they were, mm, just one second, they, they, they were in South Korea, some of them were in Europe, some of them were, were using several different grids uh, to, uh, to run the processes. Terra grid, the open science grid, DOE science grid. Um, so we're using different grids. And, um, this is another way how to look at the system. So we have user integrated database, and we have knowledge base from the public resources. We have user annotations, and we have workflow managers, and uh, we have user interfaces. So, and all of them, they. Um, we are trying to automate as possible automate, uh, the update cycle because it's very large amounts of information. 
And this is uh, the schema from the last run, uh, the, the resources that we took. Um, we are mostly using Open Science Grid, which was created by the uh, physicists. Uh, physicists somehow can find common language. It never happens in biology. <laughs> biology, it's difficult to find common language. And they will complain about common language. So that's what drives, these are different technologies that drive uh, all this um, automated workflows behind the scenes. So everything is pink and rosy and we are rolling ahead, but we do have problems. So the first problem that we have, <clears throat> uh, what is happening in biology? Uh, I wanted to give you a slide, but uh, unfortunately uh, somehow it slipped out. Uh, the, the number of the biological ontologies that are currently being developed or just in a state of development. And I am personally a member of like five committees on the development ontologies. And in Russia, uh, and I'm Russian as you can deduce from my accent, in Russia there is a, this saying which says, you are friends against whom? And this is uh, approximately what is happening in uh, biological ontologies because different groups are developing ontologies and sometimes they merge them, but sometimes it's very difficult to merge them. And uh, I, I personally think that uh, somehow it happened that ontology got into the domain of social problem. But I, I think it's actually a technological problem. And technological problem, I can illustrate why is it a technological problem and why uh, ontologist problem should be probably solved slightly differently. But uh, I can be wrong. I, I was wrong so many times. So this is on glycolysis as represented by Kaggle, right? This is glycolysis as represented by uh, ecocyc. Uh, please see how many, what is the, the difference in number of components. This is glycolysis represented by MP database. Actually, MP database has 62 different versions of glycolysis that are different in different like enzyme composition and everything else. So how people can agree in the notion of glycolysis? I don't think it, it will ever happen because all these representations are absolutely valid. This is just that it's normal that people have different opinions about abstractions. And what I think, uh, somehow people got uh, pretty good ontologies for representing facts, like sequences or sequence features, something that is, uh, can be interpreted unambiguously. Although we biologists will all, always find some ambiguity in everything. But, um, but once you will go to abstractions, you will never, ever, ever find any social consensus in representation. And that's why I think that um, what will be the solution to this is some notion of clustering of notions, some, so, so, some uh, notion of clustering of abstractions and uh, distances between different notions and distances between different abstractions. And everybody will make the decision how uh, little or how far uh, they want to go in the relaxations of the ontologies or the knowledges. So, Sorry. could you go back? Uh, just, yes, there. Can you explain us a little bit the differences between these diagrams here? I'm, I'm lost a little bit here. So, uh, what is happening is there is a metabolic pathway which is called glycolysis. This is a pathway uh, which is uh, how to break glucose to pyruvate. Some people think it's not the pyruvate. Some people think it's uh, further down. Some people will include some additional reactions to this. Some people will not include the additional reaction. Like, for example, in this particular diagram, this is the all-inclusive diagram from Keg, And as you see, it's called glycolysis. It's a very popular database. They just, uh, people using it a lot, okay? This is representation, much more reduced representation of the same pathway glycolysis. The people just name it differently. Like, they, 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 they it's, it's glycolysis, but they include only this steps to pyruvate. So is and this pyruvate is here. So is this one a subset of this? This, this one is a subset of this one. But if you will tell 
biologist, what is this? They will say, this is glycolysis. If you ask biologists, what is this? They will say, it's glycolysis. If you ask biologists, what is this? They will say, it's glycolysis. There are 62 different versions of glycolysis. One enzyme will be different. One step will be uh, different. Uh, they will still recognize that this is glycolysis. It's almost like we, like a chicken, the white chicken and the black chicken and the chicken. It's still a chicken. Everybody knows it's a chicken, but somehow we we, we know how to cluster all these chickens in our head. But um, ontologists they don't know. Like for example, I'm a member of the Biopax uh, group for the development. Okay, they will say, hmm, glycolysis is this. Okay, whatever. Um, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a different, like, and I'm not sure that it's possible to find a social consensus to it. I'm not sure that it's, it's I think it's an intrinsic problem of the data. And uh, the, the, the thing is um, that in biology, like physics, uh, they have less problems with ontologies. And the reason why is because they have a culture of abstraction which was developed very pretty well. Biologists, they don't have uh, well-developed culture of abstractions. And that's why uh, probably it's, it will be very, uh, like people will say glycolysis. Do they mean this or this or this or what, what, what whatever. So. To, to pirate. Um, I mean, but, at least one of them helps with the DNA, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And we actually, uh, after the science food camp that was here, uh, we, we, we're actually uh, starting to organize the workshop with uh, uh, Michael Berry, uh, who is a quantum physicist. So we want to bring the biology, the physicist to biology. But this one, I think it's mostly um, the problem of uh, like how you will name the things that don't have strict definitions. So, and there is a... <laughs> the, give, them give them strict definitions, but how you will, uh, like for example, this part, uh, like glycolysis, it's a well-known pathway. How you will name this part of the network, which is not a self-sufficient pathway. It, it's just um, something. You need to formalize, in this case, you need to formalize every part of the, every network you, you can get and give it a name. Or somehow establish the connections, like for example, this set of, well, let's even consider it, like look at it as a graph. The, the, this, this node is most likely to be connected to this, 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 this. And give me like the depth of the network like that. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I know the problems, I don't know the answers. <laughs> but um, it's, it's actually very, very strange that um, th there are good ontologies, but somehow, like for example, um, high throughput integrative people like us, we are not using them because they are restrictive. We are just uh, being good citizens, we go to all the meetings and that's about it. <laughs> so. We need technologies for clustering notions, definitions, and abstractions. And they, 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 they should be hierarchical to some extent, somehow. On databases. <laughs> so databases. Uh, the thing is, uh, we're analyzing the genomes for um, users. And users always have, they have one property in common. Everything is different. They always want more and different. So what they want is they want to customize the databases. They want like, for example, we're analyzing um, malaria parasite genomes. And they want to import the malaria parasite genomes from the different databases. But there are other people who are in hemophilus, they, don't, they can't even spell Epicomplexin. So in this case, they, they don't care about this. And the, when the, it becomes like a Christmas tree, you, you have this core of integrated information, but everybody wants their own uh, like needles, and it, it becomes absolutely unmanageable. And in the situation when um, the ontologies are not very well developed, what to do? I don't know. 
No, we are just saying, okay, we can do what we can do, but not more than that. But uh, it's not the solution. It's not the solution in the long run. So we have this problem. The other problem is uh, actually most of the data in uh, biology and bioinformatics, it's uh, in the form of the trees or networks. And we have very good relationships uh, with Oracle people. And we're interacting quite a bit with them because we have an identity crisis for our data. It's like, is it relational database or is it like uh, object oriented? You know, maybe really, um, let's unflatten the nested tables because they're too slow. Or let's, let's, let, let's nest the tables. So we're constantly, constantly looking for some solution to the problem that actually is a real problem for us. How to represent and navigate in complex networks. And when the networks are very large, what to do with them? Because uh, if you want to represent all of the reactions, or you want to represent all of the uh, connections between the protein, it, pr proteins in the protein space, you, you, you just you are lost. It's it's hard problem. Algorithms. So let me tell you about another madness uh, that is going on in uh, bioinformatics. So you you've seen this exponentially growing data. So what is happening, one of the major tools in bioinformatics is BLAST, which is based on pairwise comparisons between the sequences. You take the sequence and you're comparing it with all sequences in the databases. The size of the database, is, uh, they're increasing, doubling or tripling every year. So what we are doing is we are uh, very uh, optimistically uh, and uh, joyfully go into the n squared problem. Because um, very soon, BLAST is already starting to lose its functionality because um, it's, uh, if, you, if you are getting like um, the BLAST results for 100 strains of the same thing, it's not informative. Uh, so you, 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 you can't identify the uh, weak signal anymore. So. It's, uh, and we, we are personally trying to get rid of BLAST, but it will be wonderful if somebody will get rid, please, of BLAST, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's madness. And um, basically what BLAST does, it does memoryless uh, Alzheimer style clustering on the fly. Because it, it does clustering, it forgets about the results, and then it goes to the next one and does it. So it's a, uh, I don't think it's an efficient way to do analysis. So, and the other thing that we uh, absolutely need, because uh, the, as we discussed before, we want to look at multidimensional patterns. We want to, to see how things are co-evolving. Uh, in the biological systems. We need algorithms for identification of multidimensional patterns. Like, for example, how to correlate the particular type of the uh, en enzyme characteristic for certain uh, metabolic group with a uh, taxonomic representation of network and to project it on the genome. How to analyze uh, this multidimensional events that were taking place, I don't know. It's um, the, the problem between in bioinformatics is uh, the difference in language between mathematicians and the biologists. Biologists think in pictures and um, mm, the complexities. And mathematicians, uh, especially, I, I worked with uh, Roth Overbeck, who was a um, logician at some point, and he was asking me what is true and what is not true. And what is true in biology? Sometimes this, sometimes this, it's conditional. Uh, behavior, so it's very difficult to uh, actually explain uh, what to do. So uh, we need these algorithms for identification of multidimensional patterns, so we can make sense on the evolutionary of the evolutionary events. And this is my group, and I was very, very lucky. Uh, everybody is just unbelievably uh, talented and creative, and uh, really love what they're doing. And I think that this is, this is why we're just moving the church ahead and doing things. And 
Thank you very much for the, to the Globus guys. Uh, they really helped us a lot. We couldn't do anything without them. And uh, our uh, managers and everybody. Thank you. Thank you.